Welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon, where story creators talk story creation. Drake is an award-winning fantasy novelist and creative writing teacher. You can find his epic fantasy series, The Genesis Oblivion, on Kindle Vela. Marie runs a fantasy world-building channel called Just In Time Worlds, and her first book, The Hidden Blade, is available on Kindle Unlimited. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Marie and Drake. Today, we are going to discuss non-villainous antagonists. So antagonists that create conflict in your story, but are not villains. Why you would want to use them, how you would want to use them, and what themes they really fit well with. So one of my favorite non-villainous antagonists is environmental. And it's actually the movie Armageddon is really one of my favorite movies. I know it's got some soppy bits, you know, the little zoo animal romance scene is just, (laughs) but it's a beautiful movie and there is no villain. There is no bad guy. There's a couple of scientists who are being a-holes and, you know, there are people who are behaving badly, but nobody is villainous and everybody accepts that something has to be done. When the action starts there still isn't the villain there isn't somebody sabotaging them on the rocket ship there are just things that go wrong obstacles that need to be overcome and ultimately there is then Bruce Willis sacrificing himself for the sake of his daughter's you know future husband and and the beauty of the human spirit that comes through in that moment the story that I feel this allows you to tell without that villain is really the story of how noble the human spirit can be you know it it really allows you to let the human spirit shine because you don't have any evil people (laughs) detracting from the story in that in that moment in that theme i do think that you can do it with villains as well but it becomes a little more pure you know when it when you're fighting an element when you're fighting a giant rock from space or the perfect storm or what have you 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 don't have that counterbalance of well this other side is doing it because of this reason because of greed or because of power or because of hate or because of revenge or because of sadisticness or or whatever we're having that villain do and their motivations for doing it mm-hmm. because you, you you can't blame a rock from space you can't blame a storm a, a tornado a hurricane these are just you know you had mentioned before we started talking about this jaws yeah. And Jaws even, like, it's it's still just a shark trying to eat. People kill a lot more sharks than sharks kill people. Oh, yeah. Like, a oh, yeah. lot more. Yeah. <laughs> shark shark attacks are, are actually quite rare. It's, a, it's Hollywood, so they have to take Jaws yeah. to that level where it's an actual, <laughs> you know, threat, even though a so great white shark hunting people is, is ridiculous. Have you but... ever seen Sharknado? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen several of them. Yeah. I can't even. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Be but horror. <laughs> getting, getting back on track. <laughs> yeah. We're still talking about, you know, even with Jaws, mm. we're talking about a force of nature. It, you know, it's yeah. not like Jaws, especially in the first movie. It wasn't, it was, you know, we're talking about the 70s, if I remember correctly, Mm. maybe early 80s, but I think it was late 70s when Jaws came out. And so we don't, we as a species are not as, Mm. you know, wise to the ways of the world. And so most people are just like, oh yeah, no, sharks will kill you. Sharks will hunt you. Sharks bad. Your your food. (laughs) And we kind of know now that, that they don't want to eat us at all. Like they don't like the taste of us. They'll spit us out. Sure. If they're big enough, they might take your entire leg before they spit it out. Because, you know, they just but have that's that much how power. they taste. They're not actually trying to eat you. They're trying to taste you. It's just right. a sad side effect. Well, if you would you... just give up a finger and let them <laughs> taste that, you'd probably be fine. <laughs> but, but you're not very cooperative. And you're flopping around and you're running. Yeah. So they're just going to take the whole leg. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so it's still even that first Jaws, even though it was mm-hmm. they portrayed it as a, a shark that was hunting for humans for mm-hmm. food. It still was just a force of nature. It's still, yeah. you know, it's sort of like, you know, the same thing if, if we have a bear um, in that one movie um, 
whatever they crashed a plane and i can't remember it's a movie i remember there's a bear hunting them it's still just you know it's just an animal trying to eat even though bears don't actually eat humans normally that's still this force of nature this it isn't this cognizant evil this trying to accomplish some evil goal or some selfish goal uh although i guess you could say well eating me is selfish but you eat too like it's not doing it out of malicious intent right exactly So if we have these stories, if we have these stories, we have these non-malicious, that's a great word for it, non-malicious antagonists, the perfect storm, a tornado, a rock from space, a shark, a bear, a tiger. We can do a lot with those. We can do Mm. a lot of things. And obviously, if it goes animal, you can kind of personify it a little bit and, and give it certain things and certain qualities. But still, the audience knows that it's that 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 animal isn't just hunting you because it hates you and wants to kill you because you're stopping it from getting a promotion at work. Yeah. It's just trying to eat you. Yeah. It needs food. You know, everything needs food. And so it does create these different stories and these different mm. these different aspects of how the audience sees, because now the audience really only has the focus of the characters. So now it's how those characters react. These are all very human stories. And it's about, you know, the human spirit and overcoming obstacles and, and intestinal fortitude and digging deep and, and saving yourself through whatever means. And, and so it's, or it's about if you're, you know, of the opinion that humanity is not really worth it. uh, Mr. Golding and Lord of the flies. It's about the descent of the human into madness and despair and (laughs) exactly well failing i don't even know why i didn't think of this when we were talking earlier but uh castaway yeah castaway there's literally just tom hanks on an island Mm -hmm. sure wilson is there with him but we all know what wilson is (laughs) 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 he's he's, it's not like they're you know whatever Mm -hmm. Uh, and people play with that that was i was i just rewatched uh brooklyn 99 because it's just, just, just such a great written show And there is this one scene where the main character ends up getting, he's a cop, but he ends up going to prison. Mm. It's undercover, but he still goes to prison. Actually, no, no. In this one, he actually goes to prison. He was Mm. falsely accused. They end up putting him into solitary confinement and he's married. Mm. And like one of the crazy things he does is he actually makes a potato woman on the wall, (laughs) complete (laughs) with breasts and everything. (laughs) And so, you know, he's talking to her as Mm. as if it's his wife, which is another character on the show. Um, but she's really just a mashed potato woman stuck to the wall. The, those are the things that we get the ability to do as storytellers. When we have these non-malicious uh, antagonists, we have this ability to really focus on the narrating character. And it's all about them. And it's why Castaway was so amazingly compelling. Yeah. Because even though it's one character on an island by themselves, it's still about how does that character deal with this? How does what are the things that that are going through their mind and their head? And and those are compelling stories because it really, it cuts out everything. It cuts out away. It cuts away all the chaff. It cuts away all the, the superfluous information, the superfluous other things and other motivations and other, it's, it's literally just this raw human story. And so, yeah, they're really, really, really cool. Especially because it also, it also removes like the elements of like discovering a mystery or all of that kind of like, all of that's gone. You know. Or it can't be. I mean, that's you, one of the. You can include the, it, but, but well, I think one of the coolest things about Castaway is that one package where he had opened yeah. everything else because he needed to find food or weapons or or tools mm-hmm. or whatever. But then there was that one where he was like, I, I, "I'm going to deliver this," mm-hmm. and and that became a tool as well because mm-hmm. it was this reason for living, reason for surviving. I have to survive so I can deliver this FedEx package. And so, you know, that was really, really amazing addition to, to that story. Yeah, a hundred percent. But, but I mean, because it's not, the story is not about finding out about a mystery. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no like finding a villain or countering a villain steps or somebody else acting against you. There's just this force of nature coming at right. you. And, and it's been too long since I've seen that. Do you remember if he finds out what's in that package? I, I remember at the end he actually does deliver it. I don't but did remember. We ever find out? I don't remember. I'm gonna have to watch that movie again. That movie is so good. So it was. I'm gonna have to find it and watch it again. The yeah. other movie that did this really well that I saw recently ish was the Spacewalk one. And I am 
flabbergasted, if I can remember what the title is right now, but it's the one with George Clooney, where he's outside in a spacewalk and there's a scientist chick with him and they're in the International Space Station and a satellite comes at the wrong time and blows up the space station. And they have to spacewalk across the edge of, of space, across the, you know, the edge of the atmosphere to another space station. Because there's like a dozen of them up there now, I think. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But, but it's like a 12-hour spacewalk. And she's not trained. I didn't see it, but yeah, I, I remember it being advertised. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. You seriously, you have to see it because that really, there is nothing up there. Yeah. It's just space and you're just walking across this vast empty void, you know, and, and yeah, it, it was just. Yeah, but if I have to watch story. any gorgeous man for yeah. two hours, walk across nothing, I want to watch George Clooney walk Me across nothing know. for two hours. You know. I'm fine with it. <laughs> But it really is. It's so it's so well done. Um, I really enjoyed that movie because, again, it was there was no villain here. It was no one's fault. There's a lot of junk up there. Some of it went wrong and this just happened. Stuff happens. Stuff happens. You know, and now now they're in the most hostile imaginable environment trying to get somewhere to safely get down to Earth. (laughs) The Martian, you know, going there. It's it's the same thing. Right. There's no, you know, it was an accident. Mm. The storm comes up. He gets left behind. They've gone. We're mm. six months away at, at best. And he's he's pretty much got to just do it on his own and survive yeah. on his own. And, and he's got so, the additional yeah. pressure of, of as well, like the same thing as Castaway, where you're alone and you start yeah. making stuff up. Because we are, I mean, even hermits, like I'm pretty hermetic. I, I don't go out much. I don't, you know, talk to many yeah. people um, except on the internet. I wouldn't want to be completely without human contact. <laughs> right. Well, the, the funny thing is, is the very first Twilight Zone episode, the mm. very first was that. That mm. was the episode where it's this guy or he starts off on like a road or something like that. And he, he goes to this like diner and no one's there. Mm. And then he eventually gets to this little town and no one's there. And there's a bunch of mannequins and he's screaming and like, help me. And w- mm. and then you go through this whole thing of, of not understanding, like, why is the world empty? Why is there no people? Mm. What's going on here? And then you find out it's a military experiment and he's actually just in this chamber. He's in this, and you know, again, this is the fifties. So we didn't know, we knew even less back then, but he's just in this chamber and, and, mm. and he's freaking out. So it goes and there's some generals and they're like, well, I guess you can get him out now. He's lost his mind. And so <laughs> like, but that was the very first twilight zone episode was about mm. that exact topic. But isolation. Yeah. 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 And, and not being able to, and I think that cause they were, they were pretty wrong in, yeah. in how we do it. Uh, I mean, you know, it's the fifties, Rod Serling is not necessarily a scientist. He's, uh, you know, he was a writer, but I think he was only in there for, I think they said he was only there for like a day and a half. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> a day like, and a half is not going to send you nuts. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless they got really weak will, yeah. like you picked yeah. the wrong volunteer for this. Yeah. <laughs> but- like what, what did you have? What were your choices? That guy, <laughs> And like a seven-year-old girl. <laughs> like, yeah. In fact, like, I think a seven-year-old girl could probably survive a day. In a probably. <laughs> yeah, but it was great. And then, you know, one of my favorite Twilight Zone episodes is kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's the guy who all he ever wanted to do is read. And and mm-hmm. his wife bitched at him and and all of that. And he, the world, for whatever, I can't remember. It's been too long. But, but the world disappears. Everyone disappears in the world except for him. Mm-hmm. And at first he's like, oh, my God. But then he finds a library. And he's like, this is fantastic. And he loads <laughs> up this cart with all these mm-hmm. books. And as he's wheeling this cart of books out, his glasses fall on the ground. He runs them over. Mm-hmm. And he can't see. And so that's his, that's his hell. And that's, you know, that's what the Twilight Zone was. But still, it's there's no villain in that no. that you know you dropped your glasses they broke there's nothing it's not like that was on purpose or some mm. malignant i mean i guess you could say rod serling was the villain in that one because he's just a dick writing that story yeah. but it's but still no kind of that way you. one of the interesting things to me about game of thrones about a song of ice and fire is that i actually regard it as that kind of show but that's because i don't think that any of the point of view characters are truly villainous i think the actual and antag- i think they're conflict creating characters but i don't think they're villains in the sense of malicious intent they're all there to survive 
So I agree with that to an extent. I actually think the opposite. I think they're all malicious characters. There, <laughs> there's no single villain because the whole freaking cast is villains. Like you take you take a cast with one guy who's awesome, and you chop his head off right at the beginning, and everybody else is just a piece of garbage. And so yeah, you're right. There's no at that point you can't say that there's a villain because they're all villains. One of the interesting things that we discussed in in the in setting this episode up is that finding Nemo, Marlin's arc doesn't have a villain. Nope. Yeah, Even the sharks, you think the sharks are the villain. They're not. That, that fish, fish friends, that's trying to food. eat them, you know, the, the lantern fish, that guy's not the, a villain. Right. He, he wants to eat Marlin, but he's just hungry. Like. <laughs> Same thing with the, the jellyfish, the field yeah. of jellyfish. They're just in the way. They're just an obstacle. Yeah. Yeah. They're Literally not doing nothing. it on purpose. They're just there. The funny thing is, and, and I was just, you know, I taught over the last couple of days at this convention here in Vegas, and I taught theme and hmm. structure. That's, that's the classes that I gave. It was all on theoretical stuff. And I use Finding Nemo a lot in that class because it's so mm. brilliantly written when it comes to structure. Mm. And one of the, the most, I mean, not only does, does the Marlin story arc not have a villain, and you could say that the, the, that the Nemo story arc has a villain because it's the little crazy girl, the little brat mm. that's trying Darla. to kill him, but not really. Um, she just doesn't know any better. She's whatever, yeah. four or five years old, and she just doesn't understand her, the, the consequences of her actions. Yeah. But the funny thing about but the Marlin arc is not only does it have not have an antagonist at all, literally, it's not even a natural antagonist because mm. it's just I need to find my son. Yep. He also never finds his son. He Marlin's story. It's one of the only story arcs that I can even think of where the, there is no overcome for the entire story arc because Marlin can't save his son. Because his son's story arc is a coming of age story. And a coming mm -hmm. of age story, you have to save yourself. That's that's the climax of a of a of a coming of age story. So Nemo saves himself. Like, because there's that scene where Marlin finally fights his way to the city. He finally gets everything he wants. He's finally gotten you know through all the obstacles to get him that are stopping him from getting to the city. And he swims up to that city and he goes, Oh, right, I'm a fish. I can't do anything. My son is somewhere up there on land in this massive city that I have literally no access to. I can't even, I'm done. I'm done. Mm. It's over. Everything is over. And then Nemo comes swimming out and goes, hey, dad, I rescued myself. It's all good. Let's go home. And so like literally finding Nemo, he never finds Nemo. Like, I love that. That's, mm. that's a crazy kind of revelation to think about. But, but it goes even deeper than that because not only that, he has no overcome. He doesn't actually accomplish anything, which is fine because Marlin's thematic arc is not about overcoming anything. His thematic arc is about what type of parent should you be? Hmm. Should you be an overprotective parent that locks your child down and never lets them grow and never lets them experience anything? And never remember at the beginning, he's like, so today's the first day of school, but uh, you don't really need to learn anything. You, ignorance is great. You could just stay here at the house. You never have to leave the house. No school, no education, no nothing. Just stay here and, and just be safe. And so he's very overprotective, which is where hmm. he has to start. He has to start on the wrong side of the theme. But to finish that arc, to finish the what type of parent should I be? We need Nemo back into the store, hmm. but Nemo has to save himself because that's his thematic element. He's going through that coming of age story, which is all about hmm. dealing with life without your parents for the first time. And so he's doing that and he has to save himself. So Nemo gets back. And now that's when the, the, the theme is answered, but it's not really an overcome. Yeah. You know, it's not like, it's not like Luke Skywalker who has to choose between technology and faith to destroy hmm. the Death Star. Do you use your targeting computer or do you use this power that's greater than yourself? And so he has to answer that question. He has to choose. And then he has to overcome the, the thing, the big bad that they've been fighting, which is the Death Star. With Marlon, the story at that moment, the story says, OK, Marlon, you started off as an overprotective parent. That's wrong. You being an overprotective parent got your child kidnapped. You being an overprotective parent caused all of this grief and all of these problems. All of your struggles through this journey were all if you had just not been an overprotective parent, you would have had a much easier time. But now it's time. It's time for you to choose which side of the theme you want to be on. Do you want to stay an overprotective parent 
Or do you want to grow with the lessons you've learned and understand that you have to trust your children and, and let them take risks? Because in that moment, Dory has been taken by the net. And Nemo's like, look, I'm small enough. I can get in and out. It's I'm not going to be in danger. I've learned this. I've mm-hmm. I've had all these lessons that you didn't get to see, but but I did. And I, I've learned and I've grown. And you, if you would just trust me, if you would be a parent that allows me to take some risks, I could save your friend that I don't even know, but I could save her. All you have to do is trust me. And so the story is, all right, Marlon, which side of the theme are you going to fall on now? Do you let Dory die and protect your child? Or do you allow your child, do you trust your child that he is, he is able to make these decisions because he's an individual and allow him to be in a little bit of risk to accomplish something good? So Marlon, that's it. That's all Marlon does is just go, all right, fine, go save her. He doesn't overcome anything. And yet it's brilliant because his thematic element has nothing to do with overcoming anything. It's all about understanding what type of parent to be. And we know he gets it in the next scene because he's like, you know, time for school, Nemo, wake up, wake up. You got to get out there. You got to go with your friends. You're going to go play. It's going to be awesome. Get out of the house. And so we know that he learns and grows as a parent, but he doesn't actually defeat anything except for his own demons. Exactly. It's all internally focused conflict. And the story allows it to be internally focused conflict because there is no villain. Right. And it's because of the thematic elements that they're playing with. Yeah. So Nemo is one of them. And then you spoke about mix and matching, like having villains as well as this kind of environment. And I think mm-hmm. the one that comes to mind is Tolkien, right? Well, actually, that's the one we talked about. There's yeah. actually one when you were talking earlier that made me go, oh, but there's this lost in space. We have to get away from Earth. We're doing this whole thing We're you know, we've got this really non-malicious villain, mm. but they don't want it to succeed. So Dr. Smith gets on board and sabotages it. So you kind of have a non-malicious villain in the fact that we're lost in space and we have all mm-hmm. these, you know, non-malicious things we have to deal with. But Dr. Smith has screwed us for his own personal malicious reasons. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of have this mix of both. But yeah, you're right. Let's go into Lord of the Rings because that, uh, that yeah. the lost in space is just very condensed. It's, a, yeah. it's really nice. We can go, oh, yeah, no, they're fighting the elements and they're fighting this traitor. But, yeah. but Lord of the Rings has a much more complexity to it. So the Lord of the Rings example is when they're trying to get across the mountain. Now, I need you to disregard the movies if you're listening to this, because the movies made this out to be Saruman calling the weather down on them on the mountain. But in the books, it is the mountain itself that is the problem. The mountain is a genius loci, and it itself is not per se malicious, but it doesn't want to be crossed. And it therefore causes this weather and the storm to come down on them and they have to battle through the elements. Saruman has nothing to do with this. When they can't overcome the mountain, they're forced to go under it. And that, of course, leads to a very malicious entity, which is the confrontation with the Balrog. Right. So you actually have a choice in Lord of the Rings. The characters have a choice. Do they want to battle the impersonal effects of the mountain or do they want to go under the mountain and face whatever is under there? Because they did give the mountain a little bit of a, of an intelligence, a little bit of Mm. personification. And, and so you don't actually even have to go that far. You know, they could have done it where it was just, look, it's this time of year. These mountains are very impassable. Mm -hmm. We could struggle with, I mean, you don't even have to go with the fact that the mountain is literally saying, (laughs) I don't want things to cross me. You could literally just say, well, I don't, I'm just a mountain. Yeah. I'm just high up and there's a lot of you know weather and snow and wind and and it's the wrong type of year for you to be trying. If you had done it like three months ago, you could have just walked on mm-hmm. through. But because you chose to do it now, sort of like the whole Dahmer party mm-hmm. where, you know, they were trying to cross over to get over into California and they 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 were late getting there. They you know, everyone told them at that last stop was like, no, you don't want to go on. You're not mm-hmm. going to make it. And they were like, screw you. We're going to do it anyway. So it was bad choices, but nothing in the nothing in that mountain range is like maliciously like, oh, I'm going to stop these Dahmer people like they're going to eat each other. That's what I'm going to make them do. Yeah. Like yeah. none of that. It was just you chose poorly. You did yeah. the you know, you, the signs were there. You were pushing it. You made bad decisions. I do that a lot, you know, because I write epic fantasy. So it's you've got to overcome sure villains and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But really. You know, if you're going on a journey, if you're going on a quest, some of what you're going to have to fight doesn't care about you. 
doesn't even know it, it has no intelligence it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't exist in you know conscious space it's just you know it's a high mountain or or you know a lava field or whatever and it's just it you're gonna have to yeah you have to accomplish it you have to overcome it but it doesn't care if you live or die it doesn't even know you exist it, it, it's literally ambivalent to your existence those make for great scenes and those make for great moments that you can really show how your characters react to these situations where, cause I mean, if you have a villain, that's like, I'm evil and I want to, you know, eat babies. And so I'm going to steal your baby and eat babies. It's really easy to go. Oh, well, well, yeah, I'd fight against that thing too. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to no, nothing. It's going to do is going to stop me from preventing it from stealing my baby and eating it. When you get into more things that are more intestinal fortitude, where it's where you can quit yeah. and, and there's no harm, no foul. Uh, other than the fact that, you know, maybe you die, <laughs> those become a whole different level of challenge for your, for your characters. And you can deal with whole different levels of, of human, your human themes and your, you know, what your, how your audience is going to relate to those characters. And those are just great. Those are really, really good moments. Do you give up? Do you do what you need to do? <clears throat> there was that plane crash where people, you know, ate the dead. Yeah. Like, yeah. do you do that? Cannibalism is a pretty deep taboo in all of us, most of us. Yeah, and they actually just remade a movie. I I've, I saw an ad where they're doing something else, and I don't know exactly what it is, but they choose to eat people or whatever. Um, it's a recent thing. I don't even think the movie's out yet. I just saw a trailer, a, a snippet of a trailer. I know, I know in Papua New Guinea they they eat people as part of some ritual things, but there's very few cultures mm-hmm. that don't have a taboo against eating people Mm -hmm. if you're in that situation like how devastating is it to you to break that taboo you know does it haunt you (laughs) human is just the other white meat as far as i'm concerned just (laughs) roast it up it's all good just don't eat the spinal cord or the brain because that's where you get mad cow disease (laughs) don't eat the brain or the spinal cord of the species that you are everything else is edible just don't eat those things the more you know (laughs) the more you know (laughs) <laughs> this is a PSA, the more you know. <laughs> the key element for me in telling these stories is to focus in on a very human theme. Yeah. And whether that's a theme on the dark side or the light side, depends on the story you want to tell. Because as I say, Certainly. William um, William Golding in Lord of the Flies, and I mean, Lord of the Flies is a classic, right? Whatever you think of the theme, it is a classic. Yep. Yeah, I'm I'm completely against the theme. I, you know, he proves in his story that all humans are born evil. I think that 80% of humanity is actually some pretty decent folk, and 20% of us are just pieces of garbage. So I think that, you know, I'm a firm believer if I'm walking in a foreign world and and I fall and break my leg, that people are going to help me, even though they don't speak my language and don't have my skin color. And, you know, I think the vast majority of the people are going to do it. But then again, I was leaving the convention at like midnight last night and there was a shady dude. So there's six elevators and I just happened to get off on the fourth floor of this car park. It's dark door across from me. One of the other elevators, a dude got off and I'm sure he's just a dude, Mm -hmm. but he's bigger than me. And I'm a big dude. I'm six, one, you know, 200 pounds and he's bigger than me and it's dark and it's midnight. And, you know, I walk around the corner and he is literally 10 feet behind me walking down the same row of cars. And I cannot help, but concern myself with the fact that there's a dude bigger than me, 10 feet behind me in a dark park car, car park. So you have to think about that. You have to think about, you know, some people are piece of garbage and no, he just went to his car. I went to my car. We both drove away. There was literally nothing that happened. So he's a good guy, obviously, or at least, at least during that moment in his life. But we all have a fear. We all have that fear of the dude behind us, you know, with, with the club. <laughs> Golding proves yeah. that everyone is evil. Everyone's everyone is evil. born evil. That's what he proves in his story. And when I say proves... Well, I mean, Rolf isn't evil. But but remember, this is these are external story arcs. So Ralph is an actual is an allegory. He's not a character. Jack is not a character. He's an allegory. So mm-hmm. Ralph is an allegory for people are born good, and Ralph and Jack is an allegory for people are born mm-hmm. evil. That's the test, and Ralph loses. What I think Golding proves in Lord of the Flies. I mean, it's been a minute since I've read it, so you know, don't take my word for it. But, I use it to teach with, so yeah. I'm. I use it. I read it more often. I've read it more often. What I think he proves is that evil is more seductive. 
there there are those you know elements as well because jack finds it easier and this is very true i mean you only have to look at kind of the world to understand this jack finds it easier to convince the boys to go his easy path of bullying piggy rather than to walk rolf's harder path of remaining civilized right and a civilized in the context of the story here obviously right well and that's the test like i said ralph isn't a character he's an allegory and the problem is when you have a character that's an allegory they can't grow they can't change Mm. so in an internal story arc where the character the thematic element is struggling inside of the character the character can go either way luke skywalker could have used technology or faith we don't know it's his decision based off of the the journey that he just took when you have an external or story arc like lord of the flies or v for vendetta the characters are no longer characters. They are they are allegories for whatever side of the theme that they are. So with Lord of the Flies, Ralph is just an allegory. He's an allegory for all people are born evil. He can't change. He can't adjust. He can't. All people are born good, good, good. Rolf is good. I'm sorry. Jack, I'm sorry. Jack is evil. All people are born good. Jack is the one that's all. So they can't change. The character that is struggling with the theme is the world. Mm. In V for Vendetta, the world is just, is struggling with the theme of should we be inclusive or should we be should we give up freedom for individuality or should we give up individuality for freedom? That's the thematic element that we're playing with. The government is an allegory for you should give up individuality or yeah, you should give up freedom uh, for safety. So I said individuality. Yeah. So the government is you should give up freedom for safety and mm. V is you should give up safety for freedom, mm. but they can't change. V can't grow. He can't mm. adjust. He can't. And the government can't go, oh, wow, maybe we were wrong on this. Mm. And so it's the world that has to take a look at that. And the world has to decide at the end which mm. way we're going. Same thing with with that. So when at the end of Lord of the Flies, when Piggy dies, when they kill Piggy, there's that moment where everything stops. And now you have Jack and Ralph that are literally just kind of frozen in time, waiting for the world to decide. And it's the rest of the boys. The boys take the, the place of mm. everybody else. And now, the, and it could have gone either way. The boys could have gone, oh crap, we just killed a kid. Okay, mm. okay, wait, wait, wait. We've gone too far. It was fun until somebody lost an eye, but we've got to back up. This is bad, this is bad. And that would have proved that all humans are born good. Jack, that Ralph was right, that the allegory of Ralph was the correct answer. Mm. But since they were like, yeah, now we're going to kill Ralph. Screw him. That went the other way. It proved that, that everybody is born evil. And so the world then shifted to that allegory, the Jack allegory. There's, a, there's other minor themes in there. You're 100% right. But the, the actual major theme is still just about that. Yeah. And I guess I should add this. Remember, when we're, when we're doing a story, we have a theme. And the theme is a question. Are all humans born evil? That's the question. That doesn't work for me as a writer. So what I do is I turn them into two mutually exclusive answers. So if I was writing Lord of the Flies, I would have the answer, all humans are born evil, period. And then I would have the answer, all humans are born good, period. And then I would waffle back and forth between those two answers from scene to scene to scene until I get to the climax, the overcome, where a definitive answer has to be done. And you are proving that, but only in your story. So Golding, in his story, proves that all humans are born evil. That doesn't mean it's reality. That's just reality in his make-believe world. So when you're proving – so so like Finding Nemo, the Marlin arc is about should you be an overprotective parent or should you be a parent that lets your children grow? They prove that being an overprotective parent is bad. Now, I agree with that. Mm. That's the type of parent I am. I don't overprotect my children. I mean I, I always tell the story when my kids were like three years old. One of them was walking toward an electro outlet with his finger out. And my wife's all freaking out. I'm like, no, 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 no it's fine. It's not going to kill him, and he'll only do it once. It's fine. I'm going to let him make that mistake because I know it's not going to kill him. I'm here. I'm protecting to make sure he doesn't die, but I'm going to let him make that mistake because he will never make that mistake again. And I know this for a fact because I did that mistake when I was like four or five, and I still remember it to this day what it was like to stick my finger in that damn electric socket. So I definitely am not a parent who is overprotective at all, and I really don't like that. But if you disagree with that, that's fine. The story is the story. It's, it's a make-believe world. Yes, they prove this in their story. Yes, Golding proved that all humans are born evil, but that doesn't mean that it's a reality in our world. No, you must remember that the story is being proved inside the story with story facts. Yes. 
And when you write, you're writing from inside the story with story fact. Now, I'm assuming that Golding was a fairly dark kind of human. He was a broken man. He hated yeah. humanity. He went through World War I. He had a whole bunch of horrible experiences. Mm. He truly believed he was a bitter, mean, nasty person. From my, I mean, I didn't meet him, but, but all the things that I've read about him, mm. he hated people. He hated humanity. He hated all of us. And so, yeah, it shows in his yeah. writing. I find it hard to blame anybody who's been through one of either of the world wars for not yeah. coming out. Yeah, you just watch the worst of humanity doing the worst to other humans. I mean, you only have to read the war poems, the the war poets. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) That doesn't mean that you, the the reader, have to buy into, you know, that theme. Like the crazy thing is about Lord of the Flies. mm. I don't agree with his his thesis or his proof. And yet I like the story just because he proved something I don't believe doesn't detract from the fact that I still like the story. It's still incredibly compelling and incredibly interesting to follow through. So as a writer, when you're proving something in your, your story, your, your thematic element, you've chosen, this is the human message that you're going to deliver to your audience. And you've chosen which side is right and which side is wrong. Just because people disagree with you doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to like your story. It could, you know, some people, if you prove, if you prove something that they don't believe in, they just like, well, you're, I hate you Mm. and that's fine. (laughs) But, you know, Lord of the Rings is, I I think most people don't believe that people are born evil. I think most of us believe that most of us are pretty good people. Yet, why is that book so popular still? Why is it still a staple of, Mm. of, it's made several movies and, you know, so much is talked about them and why? Because it's still, it's still a human element. It's still that Mm. concern of, well, what, what would I do in that situation? How would I act in that situation? And it, and it takes you, and that's what, that's what stories are. They're, they're an escape down a path of what ifs. Yeah. And so you put yourself in that. It's like, what if I was a 10 year old boy stranded on an Island? What would I do? And so it's just, it's very compelling. Even though I disagree with what he proved, I still love the story. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like he asks fundamental questions about nature versus nurture, Mm -hmm. right? Because those boys had been in their society, well brought up young men, they shouldn't have, you know, and he's saying like, you revert to your base nature and your base nature is this kind of evil thing. And we're actually only held in check by education. That's one of his takes on humanity. Which is why like all the post-apocalyptic stuff, you always end up with a bunch of, you know, criminals. But I actually agree with that because even with 80% of the population being good and 20% being bad, if there is no law and no checks and balances, that 20% is going to slaughter the rest of us because we're going to be all like, can't we all just get along? And then we're like, no, I'm going to kill you and take your food because I'm a piece of garbage. And to be honest, you only have to look at the very long, long, long history of human civilization to be like, yeah, that, that's pretty much what will happen. Sorry, guys. Those of us who are not psychopaths get to be subjects of those of us who are. Yep. <laughs> Society was created because better, smaller, whatever, you know, just people that didn't want to hurt people got together as a group and pointed to the big bully and said, there's 10 of us now. You will, you will do what we say. And so that's literally what, why society exists is because one out of five of us are just pieces of garbage and the other four are pointing fingers at them going, nope. And so that's literally, in my opinion, this is my opinion, but that's the way I always felt about society. We've, we've banded together because I'm a big dude. I'm a former combat Marine. It's not like I can't take care of myself. I mean, I'm 52 now. So, Mm. you know, went out to dinner last night with this big buff 30 year old. And sure. When I was 30, I might've been able to give him a run for his money. But now that I'm, you know, been a full-time writer and sitting at a desk for 22 years and I don't have the, everything that I had when I was, you know, just getting out of the Marine Corps. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to definitely take me. I'm, I still don't have that attitude. I still don't have that. You know, I was a Marine not to, you know, invade foreign lands and kill people. I was a Marine because I believed in protecting people and, mm-hmm. and helping the world and, and wanting to build a better place for other people. I truly, sincerely hope we're not dealing for post-apocalypse. <laughs> I, yeah. I love I mean, the me, internet. <laughs> well, for me, the, 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 shit, the, the crazy thing is, is that if the world goes to hell in a handbasket. I don't want to be a part of it because I don't want to live without Netflix and air conditioning. No, me <laughs> And I know that's really steady and selfish, but I'm just like, I don't want to scrounge for food. I want to go to McDonald's. Like, I don't, I don't want to 
I, I, no, I'm, I'm too lazy now. You, mm-hmm. You've spoiled me too much. Modern <laughs> society. Just kill me. Just kill me. If I can't have air conditioning, just kill me. I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, no, so, no. It's so petty too, because it's like you don't need air conditioning. Just like millions of years we survive without it. Like, nope, can't. I, I can't list minutes without do it. it. Nope, nope. <laughs> so, if there was a a non malicious end of the world headed our way, we don't want to know about it. And please, just kill us. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But yeah, so you know, just to kind of bring us back to this. When we're talking about these, these are great story elements, not just in, sure, you can write an entire story about it. You can write an entire castaway Mm -hmm. or an entire, you know, perfect storm or Mm -hmm. Armageddon or whatever. And those are great stories and and allows you to play for some, Mm -hmm. with some really deep human uh, thematic elements, but look for ways to also put some of this in your actual story. I mean, just because they're fighting monsters or fighting villains or armies fighting each other doesn't mean you can't have scenes where the protagonists have to struggle against completely non-malicious things, you know, weather or mountains or lava fields or sharks or whatever. It doesn't really matter. You, you know, you can still go down these paths because it tests the mantle of your characters. And that's what your readers want. You know, I say this all the time in my classes it's the why and the effect, not the how and the what. I don't care how your character goes about doing things or what they do after they do things. I care about why they did what they're doing and the effect it has on them and the world around them. So many aspiring writers, so many up and coming writers, they write the hows and the whats. Oh, Conan got this sword and he killed this thing. And, and then he, you know, he did this other thing next. And it's like, but none of that matters. No one cares. They care about why. Why did Conan get that sword? Why did Conan, you know, fight that demon? How did that affect him? How did that affect the world around him? If you miss writing that stuff in your story, you literally miss your, you know, and I, and I pick on him, but, and I verbed it, but you Michael Bay it. Mm. Michael Bay is all about the, the hows and the what's. It's all yep. about the hows and the what's and nobody cares, but it's why you'll never watch a Michael Bay movie twice. Like I've seen Transformers. Great. It's awesome. I gave him my money, but if it's on again, I don't want to watch it again. And yet Jurassic Park is the exact same movie. It's big things killing humans. There's no difference. And yet I've watched Jurassic Park a dozen and a half times and it's awesome. And I care about the characters because it's all about the hows and the what's. And I do have to do it since I brought up Jurassic Park because there is, we were talking about the, the monsters and the, the, Mm -hmm. the, whatever, uh, not having intelligence and you can give them intelligence because then it, you know, when the, when the Australian is hunting the, uh, the, the raptors and he thinks he's, you know, the hunter thinks he's got it all. And then he's got that line where he's like, oh, clever girl. Cause he knows he's dead. He knows that they out, they out hunted him. And so obviously they're smarter than him, but they're not malicious. They're still just, you're just food. and I'm going to eat you, but I'm yeah. also smarter than you. I'm a better hunter than you. Anyway, I might not be smarter, but I'm, I'm, I'm a better hunter. You know, he has his clever girl line and, and it's brilliant. It's breathtaking. And then he dies, but you actually care. Like if, okay. if Shia LaBeouf's character doesn't even die in Transformers, but I wouldn't care either way. Had Shia LaBeouf's character lived, died. It wouldn't matter to me. That Australian dude impacted me. I'm like, Oh, that sucks. I like that guy a lot. It was a good death. It was a good death. And it also raised the stakes. Cause now it's like, Oh, they're going to kill anybody. Everybody's dead. If they're going to kill the cool Australian dude, then no one can survive. <laughs> so it was a brilliant, I mean, but Michael Crichton is a better writer than Michael Bay. Just, yep. just, just because they both have Michael in their name doesn't mean that they're equal writers. And I mean, it's, it's different styles as well, right? Cause Michael Bay writes for cool explosions. So if your movie, right. if your movie needs some cool special effects, there was one movie that we mentioned at one point where we were like, well, it's such a sad story. They should have just gotten Michael Bay to at least blow up the stuff in a cool way. And that would have made it a better movie. I can't remember which movie it was. but <laughs> I don't know if Michael Bay could ever improve a movie. But yeah, you know, <laughs> look, he makes so much money. He can afford me picking on him. All right. That's, the that's how I feel. Like there's some people that it doesn't matter that we pick on them because they don't care. Like they're, right. they're, they're laughing at us from their pile of money. He, he's not even laughing at me. He doesn't even know he doesn't I even know we exist. I, I am an ant and he is a giant. And if he steps on me, he won't even notice that he did it. He he will be the non-malicious force. He is the non <laughs> he's the non-malicious force I'm fighting against. That was awesome. <laughs> and I think that's a great note on which to end this podcast. <laughs> we'll see you all for another one.
Bye. Hey guys, Drake here. Thank you so much for listening to Releasing Your Inner Dragon podcast. I hope you're getting a ton of information and maybe even some nuggets of gold that you can take into your own writing to help you on your journey of story creation. A couple things I want to throw at you. First of all, for the first time in years, I am opening myself up to being a private mentor again. If you would like for me to work with you to improve your writing right now, reach out to me. You can either go to my website, maxwellalexanderdrake.com, and send me a contact form or or just email me at author at maxadrake.com. Also, as many of you may know, I've been out of the novel game for quite a few years. I was the lead fiction writer for EverQuest Next from Sony. I've been in the movie and TV industry for a few years now. But I am excited to say I'm back into the novel game. I've actually been working on a novel for a little while now, and I'm going to start dropping it on Amazon's Vela. So if you're on that platform, look me up, Maxwell Alexander Drake. Thank you again for listening, and as always, keep writing. Hi guys, this is Marie from Releasing Your Inner Dragon, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you're interested in more content on fantasy world building, head over to YouTube and look up Just In Time Worlds. I release tons of content there. If you'd like to check out my book, The Hidden Blade by Marie M. Mullaney, it is available as an ebook, audiobook, and print book on Amazon. Thanks for listening, and see you soon.